Please turn this morning to the book of Titus. We are continuing this morning in our section. We've, well, I've entitled the, the book of Titus, Gospel Living, and we are in part two of, of our message, What to Do with False Teachers. Now, as you know, because we spent quite a, a bit of time in the first portion of Titus, This morning's passage is on the heels of the qualifications of church leadership. And as you will, as you know quite well, Titus 1, 6 through 8 tells us what an elder is to be. I wondered if I gave a little quiz right now, how many of you could list them because we spent so long in them. But I won't do that. But let me read them to you. An elder is to be above reproach devoted to his wife, his singular, his one wife, having obedient children, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a fighter, not fond of sordid gain or greedy, but instead he is to be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. And then verse nine really does catapult us into the section that we're in today. And verse nine says that an elder must hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Now the remainder of the book of Titus really illustrates these two concepts of exhortation and refutation. And in many ways this envelops all of the Christian life. That is what we are about. We are about exhorting fellow believers and we are about refuting those who contradict. Now the term, just to take one step back, the term exhort means to come alongside and to encourage. But it is richer than you might initially think. This encouragement is to take place with an element of authoritative persuasion. When we bring the word to somebody, we don't bring it as a mere idea or a concept that can be pushed aside, it is the word of God. It is the type of exhortation that compels your brothers and sisters in the Lord to implement this truth in their lives. That is what we are called to do. Now the term for refute is broader and it can mean to reprove with a sense of rebuke And it can also mean to confront moving moving someone from one way of thinking to another. It has the idea of refuting someone's arguments in order to convince them. Now the authority of Christ in a Christian's life requires him to be both master and Lord. With Jesus as your king, he has given instruction. You are to exhort your fellow saints You are to encourage them to walk well in sound doctrine, and you are to also graciously refute others who begin to drift from sound truths of the faith. Now, what this does mean is you and I, we are not to play the role of the Holy Spirit. But you... We could try, we could try, but let me encourage you not to. But we are to be faithful. We are to be faithful to the Lord and faithful to one another. Proverbs 27 verses five and six says this, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of of an enemy. Now, for some of us, we must, if if we take this verse seriously as we must, this hits us between the eyes. Oftentimes we we want to run from, from the responsibility that we have to bring the truth to someone, especially a brother or sister in the Lord. 
But we, we do not have that option. Now, how we do it, how we do it will demonstrate to them whether we do it in the spirit of Christ or in something other. How we do it, we do have control of, but whether we do it, whether or not we do it, is not an option. Now, when we bring the truth to someone and we confront someone, maybe even rebuke someone, we don't do it under, under, we don't do it in regard to secondary issues. It is the gospel that we are concerned with. It is the gospel that is most essential. Secondary issues do matter. But what matters most is God. The triune God, his character, his person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, his work, creation, redemption, regeneration, sanctification, glorification. The gospel. Christ lived a perfect life. He died a sinner's death. He died in our place. He paid our debt. He took God's wrath upon himself. He was buried. He rose three days later. He is at the right hand of God. He's absolutely sinless, perfect, always was, always will be. Those are essential. So when we consider those elements of truth that we might divide on, that we might divide with someone over. It is the character of God, the triune God, and is the gospel that is most essential. Sometimes we ask, well, I, can I have fellowship with that person who believes this or that? Can I partner with them in the gospel? Those, that, that's a valid question, but I don't know if that's always the best question to ask. The issue is not whom we can have fellowship, but really, who, but whom does God have fellowship with? God can have fellowship only with those who are truly born again. Amen. Other theological distinctions will determine the extent of our fellowship with others, but a Christian's primary concern is rebirth. Look at Titus chapter one with me, beginning at verse 10. Let's read. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Now last week we looked at the first two points of, of this section and there's five altogether, but let me just to remind you of the first two points. Number one, the description of false teachers. Looking at specifically verses 10 and 11. Now here we see the nature of false teachers and that they, they are first rebellious they are unsubmitting and they are unruly. This is someone who refuses to submit to proper authority, whether it be parents, society, or God. The false teachers in Crete refuse to subject, some, subject themselves to the authority of Paul and in turn to the authority of the Cretan church. 
to Titus as well as the church leaders. This is why Paul left Titus in Crete, to set these things in order, to put these rebellious men in their place. Next, they're referred to as empty talkers. These are senseless babblers and vain talkers, those who speak, but they are lacking substance. Imagine a balloon that is full of smoke. You pop it, and the smoke wafts away. That's the content of these empty talkers. There is nothing to them. In time, the substance of their message dissipates. And lastly, they are false teachers. They are deceivers. This term describes someone who is full of deception, set on deceiving others. And what Paul does is he he even goes on and names the deceivers. He calls them the circumcision. Sometimes they're referred to again as the Judaizers. By the name given to the deceptive group, we know that they were adding to the law, I'm sorry, adding the law to the Christian gospel. They were legalists. They were teaching that salvation was not by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, but other elements were necessary. Saints, you know the gospel message is the most important message that had, has ever entered into this world. Amen. It is a unique message. It is a life-saving message. It is the message that God is most concerned with. It is the message that Jesus lived, died, and was resurrected for. If you are a Christian, it is a message that you are, have devoted your life to. Tampering with the gospel God's message is equivalent with high treason. It is rebellion. And the text says that for this reason, these men must be silenced. Our second point was the result, motive, and content of false teachers. The result, motive, and content of false teachers. Looking at the second half of verse 11, it goes on to say they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Look at verse 14. It gives us a little bit of a glimpse into regard to what they were teaching. Jewish myths and commandments of men who had turned away from the truth, which really describes those false teachers. We went into this a little bit more in detail last week, but false teachers are not described as being confused, not described as being misled, or wrong, but sincere. They are described as proud men who seek their own desire and passions that lead to destruction of the unsuspecting. Turn just a a book over to 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, we get a glimpse into the future, at least at the time of Paul. Paul. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Lying teachers will come in. They are liars. They are liars to the core and they will bring in a false doctrine that will be so so close to the truth yet deceptive that it will pull the unsuspecting away. 
Some of you, I'm sure, have friends who have gone through this, maybe even family members who've been tricked and they've been pulled away, they've been drawn away, they've been lured away. They've been lured away to the point where they were, well, where they will fall away from the faith. I have one dear brother who's no longer a brother who I think about often. He was a, probably about five years younger than me. I was in college ministry in California. He was involved in gangs and the Lord or at least it appeared that the Lord changed him. From all outward appearances, he loved the truth. He loved the truth of the scriptures. He loved God's word. He loved Christ. He went to Bible college. By the end of Bible college, he was done with the truth. He was done with Christ. He had been tricked. I don't know all the the ins and outs in regard to what happened, how he was tricked, but he walked away from the faith and he asked that those who called him to repentance would never call him again. That's similarly to what was happening here in Crete. Going back to Titus, whole families were being disrupted. Entire families were being disrupted because of the false teachers that had crept in. These false teachers were promoting, as I'd already mentioned, Jewish myths and man-made commandments. You don't need to turn there. We did talk about this passage last week, but in Titus 3.9, he gives us a little bit greater idea of what was really happening. But Paul commands Titus to avoid the foolish controversies of the false teachers. They argued about genealogies and strife and they, they, and they caused strife and they were disputing about the law. All of this was unprofitable and it was worthless. The first step of heretical teaching is corruption. But corruption leads to disruption, and disruption will, if it's not, if the word of God is not brought to bear, it will lead to destruction. Paul is set on meeting this corruption of God's message head on. His desire is for Titus to silence the false teachers and reprove the church families who are being led astray. Now as we consider today's passage and how it must affect us, the application is simply this, and we're gonna start there. In the local church, church leadership specifically, but all Christians generally, must silence false teachers and reprove and encourage our fellow Christians in order that the body of Christ will be sound. That is the instruction that we must take from this text. Let me read it one more time. In the local church, Church leaders specifically and all Christians generally must silence false teachers and reprove and encourage our fellow Christians in order that the body of Christ will be sound. But notice the context. It must happen within the local church. Today's passage is not encouraging us to look outside of ourselves. It's not encouraging us to look at the church down the street or across town, it's encouraging us to look within. It's encouraging to look for us to look at ourselves. We must examine ourselves carefully before we can go and examine others. May TCF be a church that sees its own logs and splinters before we try to go and remove the splinters of others. As we continue in our exposition, we move to our third point. And this should be in your notes, or in your note sheet. The third point, the illustration of false teachers, verses 12 and 13. The illustration of false teachers. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the word Cretan refers to someone who is a fool, someone who is vulgar, 
someone who is insensitive. It is often used as someone of low moral caliber, socially uncouth, rude, even a degenerate. This term has gone down in history to represent this type of person. Paul was not the first to recognize this. Even the Cretans themselves realized this about their own people. Look at verse 12. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Paul is not speaking of a, of a true prophet of God, of course, but he is speaking of one of the Cretes, one of their own people, one of their own prophets. His name is believed to be Epimenides. By some, he was regarded as one of the seven wise men of the ancient world. To well-known church fathers, Clement of Alexandria and Jerome, they attribute this saying to be I'm sorry, to a poet and a reformer who lived somewhere between 630 and 500 B.C. Epimenides lived around 600 B.C. and was native to the northern shores of Gnosis in Crete. Cicero ascribed to him the ability to foresee future events. He is said to have foretold the Persian War ten years before it happened. Epimenides penned the first words of this phrase in a song. Cretans are always deceivers. Epimenides is one is the one referred to here, and his words were commonly known, or I'm sorry, common knowledge to the people of his own day. And Paul affirms this by saying, Yes, these words are true. The point was, yes, these Cretans, they're wicked. The reputation of the Cretan people preceded them. Their wickedness was well known, much like Sodom or Corinth. Epimenides called them liars. So notorious were the Cretans that the Greeks actually formed a verb to cretize, which meant to lie and to cheat. The Cretans have had a proverbial phrase to cretize against a Cretan, which meant to match lies with lies. They're also referred to as evil beasts. This refers to their savage character, known by their cruelty and their wickedness. And lastly, they're called lazy gluttons. This phrase refers to the laziness that lacks self-control. They desire satisfaction without putting any effort toward what they want. The church historian Polybius once said that Cretans have, ex- have excessive and uncontrollable appetites. They exercise no trace of self-control, gentleness, or uprightness, and would do anything to turn a profit. This is the type of people that Paul was up against, or specifically that that Titus was up against. Paul, which might give us even a little bit of a glimpse why Paul would send one of his beloved disciples to go and minister in the church in Crete. Those who'd been redeemed and and changed, regenerated, those who'd gone from this, what we saw the Cretans are, to one day being elder qualified, loving the gospel, being devoted to it, given over to it. Paul's heart was broken for them. And in turn, we, would probably, we could probably easily say that if Titus was the man that he, that we see in Scripture, his heart was broken as well. The goal was to see this church put back in place, restored. Look back at Titus chapter one, verse 13. This brings us to our fourth point, the remedy and hope 
And I'm gonna change something if you don't mind. In your notes, the remedy and hope of God's family. That's actually the, the, the title of this point. The remedy and hope of God's family. And look at verse 13, starting in the middle. For this reason, reprove them. Reprove them severely, he says, and so that they may be sound in the faith. Verse 14, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Now, when Paul gives Titus and the church leadership the command to reprove them severely, whom is Paul referring to? There are only two options. He's either referring to the false teachers or he's referring to the families who are being upset. I'm convinced that Titus and the church leadership are to reprove the families who are being dragged away into heresy. The term for reprove is in verse nine of Titus chapter one and it's the word refute. The word is a broad term. It can also means to conv- mean to convince or convict. It is used in Matthew 18, 15. Don't turn there, but just listen. Matthew 18, 15, which says, if your brother sins, go and show him. That's the word. Show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. The word suggests that the convicted person has seen his error, felt his shame, repents, and is won over. The same word is used in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24. But if all prophesy, and then remember, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is in, is in the church. It's in the section 12, 13, 14, talking about spiritual gifts. The whole idea of there is talking about orderliness, which is supposed to take place in the church. And so Paul says, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters in, he is convicted, that's our word. He is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So in our context, the word is reprove. Sometimes it's used to mean to convince or to convict. We saw it can also mean to show someone their fault. Here, it's convicted. But the idea is that they have to be made aware of the error so that they can be brought to the truth. Now notice, they are to be reproved severely, Titus says, which means that their error is to be quickly addressed, swiftly addressed. The term for severely literally means to cut out. As Christians, we are to be so full of God's word and his wisdom that the word is to be for us as a scalpel. Biblical error is as a cancer, As fellows of the great physician, we are entrusted with the ministry of exhortation and refutation. We come to the brother of Christ and we gently and carefully extract the cancer from them. So the phrase rebuke severely or reprove severely in this context means to bring the word of God to bear on those families who have been taken by the false teaching and help them to see their error. Look back at verse 13 with me. The families are to be reproved so that they will be, what? Yes, sound in the faith. We talked about the word sound meaning healthy. They're to be healthy in the faith, sound in the faith. Verse 11 tells us that the false teachers are to be silenced because they are men who have already turned away from the truth. 
There's a contrast that's being set set up here. The church members who are being led astray, they are to be reproved so that they may be brought back to the truth. The false teachers are looked at as condemned already because they have turned away from the truth. They have abandoned the truth and now God has abandoned them. Now listen to these verses. I'm gonna read them quickly, but I will give them to you. You can write them down. But listen to how false teachers are referred to in these following passages. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Acts 29, I'm sorry, Acts 20, 29 through 30. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speak, perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Notice that's their intent. That's their goal. Galatians 1, 6 through 8, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. What's Paul saying there? Or Peter, I'm sorry. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. There is no more hope for them. 2 John 7, for many deceivers have gone gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. False teachers and false prophets are referred to as deceivers, liars, and antichrists, and those whose judgment has already been determined. I, I mentioned this last week, but when I was a young believer, and just in way, I guess, to recap, but as, as a young Christian, I remember seeing church leaders or even brothers in the Lord, people that I, I knew were more mature than I, addressing individuals who had come into the church who were teaching differently. And they were swift and they were strong and they were sure, they were authoritative. And standing back as a new believer, observing them, watching them, my first thought was, where's the grace? Where's the kindness? Where's the love? And of course, I was wrong. As false teachers enter in, they are to be beat out of the church. There is no room for them to be here. But on the other hand, those who've been deceived, those who are being drawn away, what Paul is describing for us is a divine rescue mission. False teachers are to be silenced. The family of God who is on the brink of destruction, because they have been tricked, they are to be convinced of their error they are to be encouraged to repent and brought back to the truth. Jude Jude describes what needs to take place in Jude 22 and 23. So great. Jude 22 and 23. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. 
That is how we are to come to our brothers in the Lord and sisters in the Lord who are being tricked. And this brings us to our fifth and final point, which further emphasizes the differences between God's family and false teachers. Number five, the foundation of false teachers. The foundation of false teachers. Please look at verse 15 with me. To the pure, Paul Paul says, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Here Paul gives further contrast and explanation to those who truly know Christ and those who profess who only profess to know him. The false teaching of the false teachers was some form of legalism. There was an adding to the pureness and graciousness of the gospel that was burdening and disturbing God's people. Speaking about the false teachers, commentator Patrick Fairbain says this, they have within a fountain of pollution which spreads itself over and infects everything about them. Their food and drink, their possessions, their employments, their comforts, their actions, all are in the calculation of God, tainted with impurity because they are putting away from them that which alone has for the soul regenerating and cleansing ability. In essence, the false teachers, they are denying the simplicity of the gospel. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The false teachers are adding to the gospel and thus distorting the gospel. And the result is defilement. Now what defiles us? What is it that defiles a man? Turn to Mark chapter 7. In the gospel of Mark, Jesus unveils what it, what it is that is at the heart of human defilement. And you all know, and I'm just reminding you. Verse 15. Mark 7, verse 15 says, There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. Look at verse 18. Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated? That which proceeds out of the man That is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. It is the heart that is either pure or defiled. The state of the heart determines your state. Proverbs 27, 19 says, as in water, face reflects face. So the heart of man reflects man. That's a great verse. At their core, the heart of false teachers was wicked and from a wicked heart flows wicked deeds. Belief and behavior, they are companions. Sound doctrine and good works must dwell together in harmony. But the false teachers in creed are defiled because they have inwardly turned away from the truth. Verse 14. The behavior that flows from the denial of God and his word is rebellion and deception, according to verse 10. 
greed, according to verse 11. Lying, cruelty, laziness, and gluttony, according to verse 12. And now in verse 16, we are taught that by their wicked deeds, they deny God. They are described as being detestable. Now what this word literally means is abominable, despicable. They were disgusting in the mouth of God. They are disobedient and they are even worthless. This word literally means to be tested or tried, but it's in the negative form. They were tested and tried and they were found wanting. They are reprobates and they are unfit for any good deed. Now, godly church leadership and all Christians are to be able to exhort God's people toward godliness and refute those who contradict. The text that we have been studying, Titus 1, 10 through 16, really does, again, function as an illustration from what we've previously studied in Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9 on church leadership. The church in Crete was in a very desperate position And Paul's exhortation applies to them and to us today. In the local church, church leaders specifically, and all Christians generally, must silence false teachers, reprove and and reprove and encourage our fellow Christians in order that the body of Christ will be sound. What should this look like? We know what we're to do now. How are we to do it? Where would you turn? Turn with me to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, specifically verses 15 and following, refers, or is specifically re- referred to as church discipline or as the portion of scripture that deals most specifically with church discipline. But I would say at the heart of it is church restoration. That's the goal. The goal is to always bring individuals back. The goal is never to push them out. Now, what we're talking about is the families that, going back to our text, is the families that were being upset, those church members who were being disrupted. False teachers, they're to be removed, eradicated. But wayward church saints are to be restored. Matthew 18, verse 15 It begins, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Now, this is an issue in which someone has false teaching. Again, in our context, in Titus. You realize the error. Maybe they're beginning to teach it. Maybe you hear it. Maybe you talk about it. Well, you go to them in private. This is a one-on-one matter. You go to them, you address the issue, you talk with them about it. And remember, Titus verse 113 tells us to reprove them severely. The idea is that we go, we bring them the word, we attempt to convince them and allow the word to do its work in their heart. We cannot say it enough, we are not the Holy Spirit, we do not want to be, we are not the fourth person in the Trinity. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Your desire must be to win him. To win him over. Verse 16, but if he does not listen to you, you take one or two with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. The goal again is to win them. In love, in graciousness, in mercy, you come to them and you reprove them for their good. Verse 17, but if he refuses to listen to them, 
You bring it to the church. Now, some of you might say, well, the ante ups pretty quickly here. It goes from one to, to three or four, and then all of a sudden everybody knows. But the purpose is to win him. Win her, win them. Bring them back. Continuing in verse 17. But if he still, or and if he still refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, don't go too quickly beyond that first part of, of, the, of the second half of verse 17. If he refuses to listen even to the church, what he's saying there is you go first by yourself. If he refuses to listen, you bring two or three with you. If he refuses to listen to the three or four, then you tell it to the church. The whole church goes to them. The whole church calls them to repentance. The whole church pleads with them to come back to the truth. There is no description for us in how long that takes. It might take some time. We show them mercy, we show them kindness, we be patient. We consider ourselves, if we were in the same situation, how patient would we want someone to be with us? But if they still refuse, then at that point, you let them be as a Gentile and a tax collector. Which means what? Okay, does it mean you don't talk to them? Does it mean if they come to your door, you, you shut it in their face? It means that you bring them the gospel. It means that you bring them the gospel. Now, there are other elements which may be, maybe they are, maybe they don't want to talk to you. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they, they have just wholeheartedly taken the doctrine that was wrong or incorrect and have made it their own and they don't want you. You plead with them. You encourage them. But you bring them the gospel. At this point, there's no reason to believe that they are born again. Their fruits demonstrate otherwise. Look at verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that, may, that they may ask, it, it shall be done for them by, the, by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, I am there in their midst." Now, is this talking about prayer? No. What he's saying there is when the true church gathers together to bring, really, uh, to, to bring God's word to bear on individuals who have strayed away from the truth and you've gone to the point where you've worked through the steps of church restoration and they are still refusing to repent, that as a church, as God's bride, you treat them as Gentiles and tax collectors. You remove them from your midst. God, if it's done in a way that honors him and pleases him, God is there with you. God is on your side. God is agreeing that this is the right thing that needs to be done. This is what needs to happen. Church discipline is not an act of hatred, it is an act of love. Removing false teachers from a local church is an act of love for those who are in the church. Reproving wayward brothers and sisters in the Lord is an act of love. It is in no way an, an act of hate or an act of judgment. 
judgment in a bad sense, in a negative sense. It is an act of judgment. But that sort of judgment is affirmed in Scripture. Reproof, saints, is your duty. It is your duty. But it must be bred out of a love for Christ. An overwhelming sense of inadequacy because of our own sinfulness, our own flesh, our own weakness. But it's done out of a heart that loves. None of us watching an oncoming train would allow a child to continue to play on the tracks. We would run, we would scream, we would act like a fool in order to save the child. We must view false teachers as they attack the gospel as an oncoming train. We must remove God's people from its way. And those who have been lulled to sleep by the oncoming lights and the gentle roar must be shaken from their stupor in order that they may be saved from sure death. That is biblical love. Please pray with me. Father, as we as we come to you now, we are overwhelmingly grateful and thankful for our salvation. Father, we know within us lies really no good thing outside of Christ. We are unable to please you and to glorify you and to honor you as you desire, even command. But once changed from the inside out, you are pleased. We can enter into your presence. Our hearts of stone are are now hearts of flesh. Our consciences have been awakened, our minds have been opened, and we understand now the truth of the gospel. Father, even just thinking back a few days to to Thanksgiving, there is nothing that we are more thankful for than Jesus. Father, we help us to be men and women who love Christ, who love the gospel, who love the word. And help us to be men and women who love one another. Help us to be faithful enough that when the time comes, we will be truthful. We will be honest. And even when, when it brings us fear, we will encourage our beloved brothers and sisters to turn away from lies and to embrace and to re-embrace the truth. Father, we have your spirit that dwells within us. There is nothing that we need to fear. Help us to be honoring to you in all that we do. And help us to remember that every day is, a, is preparation for when things get difficult. Help us to be men and women of your word so that we will know how to answer those who need it when the time comes. Father, we love you. We thank you for our salvation in Christ. And we pray, Father, for the remainder of, of our day today that we would honor you and help us in this week to honor you May you get all the glory, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen.